Uh, I'm so pleased to be welcoming David K. Johnston uh, to Politics and Prose this evening to present his latest book, The Making of Donald Trump. Uh, no matter what side of the political spectrum you land on, I think we can all agree that Trump's rapid rise to political uh, stature is shocking. Um, this new book sheds light uh, on many of Trump's beliefs, which uh, still evade both those of, those of us um, who are repulsed by him uh, and those who have relinquished their moral values to support him. <laughs> um, it's fair and balanced here. Uh, these views are the reflection of my own uh, beliefs and not necessarily the stores. Um, David K. Johnson is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist whose work has appeared in many media outlets. Uh, his four decades long career of award winning investigative journalism um, has appeared in the Detroit Free Press, uh, the Los Angeles Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the New York Times. Uh, his journalism has, has, ma has had major influence on the topics he has covered from exposing political spying and brutality uh, in the Los Angeles Police Department um, to changing American government policy uh, and freeing an innocent man wrongly accused of a vicious murder. He writes a weekly column for thedailybeast.com as well as a, uh, frequent opinion pieces for the USA Today, uh, the New York Daily, t uh, New York Daily News, uh, nationalmemo.com, and the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle. Um, he's also a consultant on electricity regulation, rare earths, and journalism uh, for the Netflix series House of Cards. Um, so please join me in welcoming David K. Johnston to Politics and Press. Well, how wonderful to see so many people here. Um, so I want to start off telling you a little bit about Donald and me and how this book came about. All right. Uh, because I don't do politics, I do policy. So this is a very strange uh, place for me. Uh, in 1988, I left the Los Angeles Times and went to Atlantic City for the Philadelphia Inquirer because I believed that casino gambling was about to explode across America and become ubiquitous, which in fact it did. And almost immediately upon arriving, I met the most important person in Atlantic City, Donald Trump. And it became almost instantly obvious to me that he was our P.T. Barnum, selling you tickets to the Fiji Mermaid and other things like this. Shortly after that, I began talking with his competitors, with Steve Wynn, um, a serious, successful gambling mogul, with some gamblers, with government officials, and with Donald's own people. And they all told me, Donald doesn't know anything about the casino business. And I'm like, that's, you know, how can that be? I mean, that's not possible. He doesn't know anything about the casino business. So the first time Donald and I sat down to have a cup of coffee, I deliberately said something to him false. And it had to do with craps. And of all the documents I've saved on Donald, at one point before digitization became possible, I was renting two storage lockers just to keep my files on Baron Hilton, Jack Welch, the LAPD, Daryl Gates, uh, but mostly uh, files on Donald. Uh, I can't find that notebook. <laughs> but anyway, I asked him a question about craps in which I put in a false statement. And Donald immediately embraced this falsehood and put it into his answer. Now, this is what the psychics you see advertised on daytime TV do. This is what con artists do. So in case he had done that, I had prepared several other questions like that where I dropped things into the conversation that were false. And every time, he immediately embraced the falsehood and put it into his answer. And that's when I realized, this guy's a con artist. Whatever's going on here, he is fundamentally at heart running a scam. Now, I chronicled Donald's behavior back then. I was the person who broke the story that he was not a billionaire. And uh, when the official government proceedings established this a few months later in 1990, we ran in the Philadelphia Inquirer on the top pa front page above the masthead the story with the lead that began, you are probably worth more than Donald Trump. <laughs> He had a negative net worth of about $295 million. So I have followed Donald ever since. Uh, four years ago, when Donald announced that he was running, um, he was treated quite seriously by my peers. Lawrence O'Donnell and I separately came to the same conclusion. He was really running for a new contract with NBC for his television show. This time when he announced, 
I was the only national journalist who said right out of the box, he's serious this time, and I said he might, wasn't likely, but he might get the nomination. And the difference was that his show was very long in the tooth. If you're Donald Trump, the worst thing you can imagine happening, short of your own death, would be for the Daily News and the New York Post to come out with covers that both say, NBC to Trump, you're fired. <laughs> Secondly, Donald saw this field that had no real obvious leader, and the one guy who might have been considered presumptive, Jeb Bush, would be pretty easy to pick off. And Donald also, if he ran, would be establishing that he had a bigger audience than he had had for his show, Celebrity Apprentice, and he could get a bigger contract. I then was appalled at the news coverage by my peers. Now, I watched live when Donald came down with his wife, Melania, in front of him to make his announcement. And he went into this racist, xenophobic rant against Mexicans and Muslims and others. And all these young people were applauding. I'm sorry, Midtown, Midtown Manhattan is not Philadelphia, Mississippi, where Ronald Reagan launched his campaign for the White House. And I thought, oh, well, OK, so he bust in some people from somewhere. Well, no, the Hollywood Reporter the next day or two broke the story that, in fact, they were actors, paid 50 bucks each to show up. And in understanding Donald Trump, in understanding that he is essentially a fraud, that if you like Donald Trump, it's because you like what he sold you, not who and what he is. So I called up my literary agent. I said, we got to go to a book. And she called around and said, nobody believes he's going to get the nomination. It's not going to happen. <laughs> By the time publishers got around to deciding there was a book here for traditional publishers who take a long time, it just wasn't going to happen. And in the meantime, I wrote about two dozen pieces about Donald in a whole set of different forums, uh, Politico, USA Today, National Memo, and the Newsweek and some other places. And then Melville House called, and their specialty is doing books in a hurry. And I had done one book before in a hurry. And they said, can you do this book in three weeks? <laughs> And I said, no, but I'll do it in four. <laughs> and I did. I wrote this book in 27 days. Wow. And I was able to do that because having done the lead rewrite for big front page stories in the New York Times and the LA Times, I knew how to assemble and do a project like this in a hurry. And those of you who've read the book know that, unlike my other books, there aren't a lot of literary values in it. It's mostly fact, 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 with 44 pages of notes at the end. So having laid out this introduction to you, I want to tell you a couple of key things about Donald and, and a couple of key stories about him. Uh, Donald Trump is all about money. And you, every one of you sitting in this room, you either recognized his greatness and bask in it and glory in it, or Donald has a word for you. Loser. <laughs> Donald is a man who's publicly humiliated the mother of his children, who you'll read in my book made up stories that beautiful women, Kim Basinger, Madonna, Carla Bruni, were pounding on his bedroom door because, after all, every woman in America has got to have Donald. <laughs> By the way, not only did none of these women want to notch their lipstick case, Two of them had never met him, apparently, and the third one had a brief conversation with him and refers to him as the king of sleeves. <laughs> now, Donald has spent his entire life doing business with con artists, with mafia, with Russian mobsters, with swindlers, his entire life. Not surprisingly, since his father, Fred Trump, a very industrious guy who also was a profiteer on post-World War II housing projects, had a business partner, Willie Tomasello, who, according to law enforcement reports and the New York State Organized Crime Task Force, was an associate and a front for the Gambino and Genovese organized crime families. So Donald, not unsurprisingly, after graduating from college, where you know he keeps saying nobody's ever seen President Obama when he went to Colombia. 
like, you know, the women who've been interviewed about the dates they went on with him and the people who played basketball with him. And none of those people apparently existed, Donald. Uh, he was, hardly anybody saw him at uh, Penn, although I did interview Candace Bergen, who told me that uh, they did go on a date, which, as uh, she put it, ended early. <laughs> But when Donald got to New York, he made a beeline to the notorious Roy Cohn, Senator Joe McCarthy's attack dog. And that relationship helped him. He regarded Roy Cohn as a second father and as a mentor. And he said in writing that he loved Roy Cohn because Roy would brutalize for you. Roy would brutalize for you. So that leads me to this story I want to tell you about what happened when Donald's father, Fred, died. Fred was a really industrious guy. I mean, he had a little business at the age of 15. So did I. And um, when he died, two days or three days after his funeral, a new great-grandchild was born, a descendant in the line of Freddie Trump Jr., who had died early. Uh, he was an alcoholic and did not have a happy life. And this child immediately became ill, desperately ill, stopped breathing twice, needed terrifically expensive medical care. Now, like many family-owned businesses, the Trumps provide everyone in the family with health care. And Donald is a big believer, it's one of the best things about Donald, in universal health care. Well, Robert Trump wrote a letter to the company's insurance administrator, uh, Precise, and said, whatever the bills are, just pay them. Don't ask questions, just pay the bills to take care of this child. And then Fred Trump's will was read. And it turned out that instead of dividing his pie four, five ways, it was divided four. The line of the late Freddie Trump Jr. was cut out of the will, except for some minor gifts. Surprise, surprise, that line of the family went to court arguing undue influence. That although Fred Trump had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's about a year and a half or two years after he wrote his last will, they argued that some influence had been applied on him to cut them out of the will. The reaction to this by Donald Trump was that he immediately cut off all health care for this child. I want you to think about this. Donald Trump, over money, put the life of a sickly infant in jeopardy, his own blood, over money. And when he was asked about this, he said, well, what else can I do? Well, don't you think this would look cold-hearted? And Donald's answer is essentially, well, you know, I don't like people who sue my father's estate. No compassion for the child any more than there was no compassion for the Khan family whose son is a serving American military officer killed in combat. No empathy for another person because other people to Donald are simply objects to be used. Now I want to contrast what happened with this sickly child. A judge ordered that the health care continue, there was some kind of negotiated settlement, and as Donald does with negotiated settlements all the time, and by the way, contrary to his statement, he never settles, he settles all the time, the condition of settling was they had to seal the record. So we don't know exactly what was done for this child. Well, Donald was confronted with the issue of mercy a few years earlier. So as I tell you this, keep in mind that Donald had no mercy for his own grandnephew. Donald had a famous helicopter if in the 80s. You may have seen him flying around in it and getting pictures of it called the Ivana. It's a Euro supercopter. And then he had a fleet of helicopters to run high rollers down to Atlantic City and back. And he, these copters were provided and managed by a guy named Joe Wexelbaum, a convicted felon and associate of mob families. There were lots of companies that had helicopters. There were better financed companies than this one, but this is who Donald chose. It turns out Joe Wexelbaum had a second business. He was a major drug trafficker. He ran a drug ring that got cocaine and marijuana from Columbia. They picked it up in Miami. According to the court papers, Joe Wexelbaum personally handled the drugs. He sometimes helped load them into the cars. He would give the drivers money or plane tickets or whatever they needed to go on. 
and they would go up to Cincinnati and areas near there. He was indicted in the fall of 1985. Now, when you own a casino, you have a privilege. The Supreme Court, and those of you who read my book, Temples of Chance, know that casinos are not a right, they are a privilege. Therefore, the state can impose virtually any rule it wants on you, and the state of New Jersey said you must prove by clear and convincing evidence that you can pay your bills on time, that you are morally fit, and that you do not associate with criminals. Well, Donald didn't get rid of Joe Wexelbaum's helicopter company at this point. Joe Wexelbaum then agreed to plead guilty. The DEA had him cold. And he asked that his case be moved either to Miami, where the drugs began and he had a home, or New York City, where he lived. The case instead was moved to New Jersey, which neither the prosecutors nor the defense lawyer have ever been able to explain. And it came before, out of the more than 800 district court judges in America, Judge Marianne Trump Berry, his sister. Now, Judge Berry is required to recuse herself from this case. And she did about three weeks later. But just think about the conversation that went on here. She goes to the chief judge and says, um, you know, I can't handle this case with this big drug trafficker because my husband, who's a lawyer for my brother's casinos, he flies in those helicopters all the time, and I fly in those helicopters, and you're the chief judge saying, I got a federal judge flying around in a drug trafficker's helicopters. <laughs> Potential here for real embarrassing things to happen for the federal judiciary. Donald, meanwhile, shows his mercy to this man. He writes a letter pleading for him to get a short sentence, calling him diligent, saying basically he's a stand-up guy, you know, who should be treated lightly by the courts. When the New Jersey Division of Gaming Enforcement goes to ask Donald about the letter, he says, I don't know what you're talking about. You could construe that as a cover-up, certainly as lying. So they go back and get the letter that they didn't have. They show him the letter, and Donald says, uh, yeah, that's my signature. End of inquiry. Not, why are you doing business with this guy? Why did you do business with this guy? What other business relationship did you have with him? What's going on here? They did ask a few questions about, and you'll read in the book, an apartment that Joe Wexelbaum and his brother rented under rather unusual circumstances, an apartment in a different building than Trump Tower, but that was owned personally by Donald Trump. Well, Joey Wexelbaum comes up for sentencing before the new judge. He gets a very light sentence, and 18 months after he walks into prison, he walks out. He also says he has no money, he can't pay his uh, fines. By the way, the, the people who drove the drugs, the little fish, 20 years. Up to 20 years. So Donald's letter seeking mercy worked. This big drug guy, he got a light sentence. Now think about that not only in the context of his not showing mercy, but rather brutality toward this sickly child who's helpless. But in terms of all of Donald's attacks about murders and rapists and drugs, and you know, in the black communities of America, he basically has said nobody has a job and everybody has crime and no one has an education. Think about those in the context of that. By the way, when Joe Wexelbaum came out, he said he didn't have money to pay the fines that he owed that were imposed by the court but he did move into a $2.4 million apartment in Trump Tower. <laughs> now, all throughout his career, Donald Trump has been the subject of lawsuits. He cheated employees. He's cheated vendors. He has been accused of swindling investors in projects that his name was on. He settled many of these cases and had them sealed, so we don't know exactly what happened, but we have his testimony in many of these cases. And his testimony is generally one of two categories. I had no idea. Or, well, you were lucky if you invested in this that the project failed when it did. You could have put all your money into the project and you'd have lost more money. <laughs> That's his approach to these things. Donald when it comes to these deals, also often pleads that he doesn't know things. And you'll see some answers that he gives to questions presented to him under oath where his answers are gibberish. 
I don't know what else to call them. Uh, you may have watched in December the Republican debate. And in that debate, Hugh Hewitt, very smart right-wing radio talk show host and a lawyer. He represents the companies in environmental deals. He's on the protect the company's interest side. And he asked Donald Trump, what's your priority among the nuclear triad? And Donald Trump's answer, which I quote in full, was gibberish. I don't know what else to call it. And Hugh Hewitt asked the question a second time. And Donald says, oh, nuclear, nuclear, that's like it's so massive and impressive. You know, it's like it's a big deal. <laughs> and Hugh Hewitt says, Senator Rubio, same question. Well, let me uh, first, uh, uh, Hugh, tell the American people what the nuclear triad is, if they don't know. It is the ability of the United States military to deliver nuclear weapons from submarine-based missiles, land-based missiles, or bombers. When you've got to be schooled by Marco Rubio, you don't know much. <laughs> but here's the thing that the, my wife and I were watching that debate, and I said that should be the lead item in the coverage of the debate tomorrow by everybody. That this is this most crucial matter of your finger on the button and Donald doesn't know anything. And I said, however, my guess is it'll get minimal mention. Well, actually, a lot of the stories didn't even mention it. They completely missed it because politics reporters cover the horse race. They don't cover policy. They don't know, they don't know what the nuclear triad is, nor did they know the significance of this question. But here's what turns out people didn't know that's in my book. Hugh Hewitt asked the exact same question four months earlier on his radio show. So Donald had four months to get schooled on this. And I ran into Hugh here in Washington a couple of weeks ago, never met him before, and I, he didn't know about my book, and I told him the story, and he says, yeah, he said, boy, he had four months to get ready for that, didn't he? And he didn't do a thing. Donald doesn't know anything. All you have to do is actually step back and listen to what he says. I'm going to tell Nabisco and Ford they can't build a factory in Mexico. It's not within the powers of the President of the United States to go around telling corporations where they're going to spend their money. And where are the principled conservatives on this issue? Can you imagine if President Barack Obama came out and said that? Donald Trump, through his companies, owes millions and millions and millions of dollars to the Communist Chinese Bank of China which is essentially controlled at the end of the day by the nine thugs who lead the government in Beijing. Can you imagine what would happen if Hillary Clinton, it turned out, had a credit card from the Bank of China? <laughs> Donald Trump has received millions and millions of dollars from Russian oligarchs. One of his sons has said, oh yeah, they're one of the biggest sources of money that we have. I don't know how many of you saw, but there was a really terrific, well-done story in the New York Times a few days ago about all the people who are enemies of Putin, either, Pluto, either uh, oligarchs or journalists, who've been murdered. And down in the story was this little line that the Duma had passed a law so that Putin could kill people outside the country. Now, we've killed a few Americans outside the country, but they're people who've declared themselves enemies of the state. And you can argue whether that's right or wrong, but look at what Putin's doing. They're poisoning people and poisoning innocent people in some cases, having people shot. If you're an oligarch in Russia, you're either a friend of Vladimir Putin or you're in jail or you're living in fear and trying to get out of the country. Donald Trump keeps advancing Vladimir Putin's objective. Weaken or destroy NATO. Imagine what would have happened if we had had George W. Bush saying, hey, you know, we should just weaken NATO the trouble he would be in over this. The, the most important thing, and the reason I wrote this book, is that Donald Trump is a master at a couple of things. He is a master at setting up business deals in which he puts up no money. He never had a dollar invested in Atlantic City. And extracting money from these deals. That's why his Atlantic City casino business was among the first to fail. There are profitable, successful casinos in Atlantic City right now today. But Trump's name will disappear on October 10th from the last casino because he had badly run places and instead of investing in the business and growing the business and doing what, and, and I'm somebody who has co-founded a little business, peanut business, but 25 workers, we reinvest in the business so it keeps growing to create wealth. Donald Trump, pull money out as fast as you can. Pay no attention to the welfare of the business, just get cash. 
when Donald Trump filed bankruptcy and stiffed all these contractors, some of whom their businesses failed, many of whom for years struggled to keep the doors open because they felt an obligation to their employees, Donald demanded big, huge fees be paid to him during the bankruptcy or he would tie them up in litigation. And so they paid him until in the fourth bankruptcy they paid him to go away. Donald is the most masterful manipulator of the conventions of journalism I have ever seen. Donald understands, first of all, that most journalists are very good at accurately quoting people and accurately getting other sides of the story and quoting them, but have no deep understanding of what's going on. And he exploits that. He knows that the tabloids, especially Rupert Murdoch's New York Post, have no real regard for any set of facts. They'll take a good story any day of the week. So he plants a story that his longtime mistress, whom I knew about long before anybody wrote about her, but I didn't regard it as a story. Billionaire has mistress. No, plane takes off and Washington lands in LA. Not a story in either case. <laughs> he plants this story with a big picture of his smiling face on the cover of the post, best sex ever. Marla Maples, by the way, as you'll read in the book, has disclaimed that statement. She didn't make it. <laughs> he creates this image of himself as this Midas. It's all a fraud. It is a fraud. There's nothing there. And I know some of you are going to want to ask, how much is he worth? And I'm going to tell you, I don't know, but I know he's not worth, as he said in a matter of days last year, 8.7 billion, 10 billion, more than 10 billion, 11 billion. <laughs> What I do know is what Donald said under oath when he had to answer questions about how much are you worth. And he said, well, it depends on my emotional state. <laughs> and the lawyer goes, excuse me, the lawyer who is now the head of enforcement at the SEC. And he asks a little further, and Donald says, well, yeah, I mean, it depends on how I'm feeling that day. That's, uh, you know, what's happening in the world and how my mood is. That, that's how I determine my net worth. Now, if this guy wasn't running for president of the United States, I think we'd all agree that's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. That is, that is, nobody does it that way. And throughout his life, Donald has gotten away with this because almost nobody challenges him. Wayne Barrett, probably the best reporter who ever worked in New York City, uh, who got onto Donald very early on and wrote about him at length in the Village Voice and who, despite working in the Village Voice, had the most extraordinary law enforcement sources of any reporter I've ever known. And I and a guy named Neil Barsky at the Wall Street Journal until Donald pulled a trick on him and he got fired. We were basically the only people really examining Donald. Everybody else, he was a good story. What are you, we, what are you gonna go do a bunch of work for? Donald said this thing and it's a good story. And we would say, yeah, well, let's go look up the records. And we would question what was going on. there. So uh, before we go to questions, I just I wanna get across to you that the person you have seen the image created by Donald Trump with the complicity of our major national news organizations who are utterly failing in their duty with a few notable exceptions. The Washington Post has tried pretty hard. One TV reporter, Katie Turr, has at least asked the tough follow-up questions on him. By and large, Donald Trump has gotten from the press what he wants to create this image that he is the modern Midas that, as he said, I alone can save you. That's not the statement of a leader of a free people in a democracy. That's the statement of a would-be dictator. Amen. He has said, I love the blacks. <laughs> and you would think most journalists, even white journalists, would have enough sense to say, boy, that's an interesting way to phrase that <laughs> statement. And they might want to go look up the times that Donald has been found to have engaged in discrimination against blacks and women and Asians. Found to have done so, been fined for it. They're not doing that. Why is he on all the time? Why has he gotten what I, by the last measure I saw, was more than $4 billion of free media? Because he's like a train wreck. People won't turn away from the TV. Fox News has put out the story that when they turn off Donald, people turn off their TVs and, or go to another channel. This is no way to run a democracy. This is serious business. 
And unlike Donald Trump, who can say in his TV show something totally contrary to sound business practice, and I say this as somebody who I teach graduate business students and law students part-time, you're fired. He can't fire the dictator in North Korea. He can't fire the Speaker of the House. He can't fire a federal judge who issues an order he doesn't like. Donald Trump tells you he has this sort of vague plan. He's going to build a wall. He's going to get the trillions of dollars, or certainly many hundreds of billions of dollars needed, however he does it, because he's changed slightly now to round up people in the country illegally. Not the people, by the way, I describe in my book who worked for him and who he cheated out of their wages. But round them up. And other things he's discussed, that he can't do it unless Congress passes legislation allowing him to do that and providing the money. Have you ever heard of a President of the United States picking a fight with the Speaker of the House? And then appointing to run his campaign a guy like Steve Bannon, who says at Breitbart that Paul Ryan is a double agent for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> this is craziness. So um, I, I want to take questions from you. I hope that you will read the book. It's a quick read because it's written in news style. There are 44 pages of notes at the end so that you can look up stuff if you don't believe me. Uh, my personal email is in the book. And a few people have gotten a hold of me in case people have questions about what material comes from. And I will just leave you with this last point. When I was 18 years old, the San Jose Mercury recruited me to be a reporter, and they hired me at 19. And throughout my career, I have broken stories where people told the editors at the Mercury and at the LA Times and at the New York Times, you know, that's just crazy, that can't be. You know, when I said that the police chief in LA was assigning officers to sleep with women to get political information, that can't be. That they were committing crimes and started a riot, can't be. Had officers undercover in Moscow and Havana. Subsequent events, it all came out to be true. The police chief, in fact, himself bragged in his autobiography that LAPD had undercover officers in Moscow and Havana. And in 50 years at this, where I've accused people of murder, Jack Welch gave up his retirement perks, uh, the head of Ernst & Young lost his job, President Bush made his only tax policy change, uh, the Clintons changed how they filed their personal tax returns. Every bit of the work has held up. It's been scrutinized all over the place, and it's held up. And in this book, you're going to find stuff that will hold up and I only wish I'd had five weeks to do the book because there's a whole much more I wanted to put in there. Thank you. So the uh, microphone is over here. And the only thing I'd ask you to do is, if you're going to come up to the microphone, ask a question. Think about what you want to do and ask the question because a bunch of people are going to want to ask questions and I want to do as many as we can. You make a very persuasive case, completely persuasive. Um, why has the Republican Party allowed Donald Trump to be where he is today? Because Donald got the votes. I mean, it's as simple as that. And, and, but what you're seeing on a broader scale is parties are not important anymore. What, what's important, and Citizens United really hammered this home, is it's the people who are financing the campaigns, these very narrow groups of people in the country who are financing campaigns. Uh, parties don't have discipline. When the German TV interviewed me, and I've been, well, I haven't been on ABC, NBC, or CBS. I've been on all these uh, national shows in Australia and Canada and Germany and France about the book. Uh, one of the correspondents said to me, you know, if a minor backbencher said just a few of the things Donald said, the party would discipline this person. If that didn't work, they would get him out of there. Party has no power here. And so that, that's what's happening. And I think you're going to see a major realignment. I mean, I've, I've said in the past this may be the end of the Republican Party as we know it, the way the Whigs went away in 1856. But they're going to have to have a major realignment. And those Republicans who have not separated themselves from Donald Trump, uh, Glenn Beck said the same thing last night on Lawrence O'Donnell that I've been saying. I don't know how you get the stench off after the election. It's like permanent skunk juice. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sir. Oh, sir. Oh. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, there is a book that came out, oh, six months ago, 
that was a political biography, I'm sorry, a political campaign biography by uh, Trump, and I'm sorry I've forgotten the name of yeah. it. Yeah, I've got all of Donald's books and I've read them. Yeah, you, you must have it. Uh, the uh, tr- It was originally Crest- called Crippled America, but he's retitled it. Yes, I think it's retitled. In, in any case, no one uh, in the uh, media have mentioned that book. And okay. I'm so why, why is the book not getting mentioned? Yeah. It actually got a fair amount of coverage when it came out. And I, I would always caution you against saying no one has because if you go look, you'll find. Sure. Somebody yesterday uh, posted at Twitter that no one had written about None of the news had written about Hillary Clinton, the State Department, and her emails. So I went to Google. <laughs> Nineteen million eight hundred uh, uh, places it found. Uh, but I think it's gotten relatively little attention, like most books do, like this, because they're written for the audience of supporters, and they're not serious tracks. Okay, I mean we've had a few rare exceptions. Uh, uh, Barack Obama's book that he wrote, I think, was one of the very few exceptions to uh, having a serious book. So in the other. Uh, the question. other question is, uh, can you predict what the new Trump that they're trying to invent now, Yeah. Uh, how successful might he be? And okay. what, what, what are they? I, I am not a politics reporter, so I have absolutely no idea about that. But let me be clear. When people argue around Trump, you know, you're going to see the new Trump. Um, I saw a little snippet on TV one day just by chance where there were a group of middle-aged women talking about Trump. It may have been The View or a show like that. Uh, and, and one of them said, yeah, well, this is like your, and these, remember these women are like 45. It's like, you know, your girlfriend says, oh, I found this guy, and we're going to get married. And after we get married, I'm going to change him, and he's 70 years old. <laughs> Sir. Um, this may be a little bit too local, given the, lo- the little bit of time you had to, to deal with Washington, D.C., but... Uh, Supposedly, uh, sometime around the 12th of September, Trump International Hotel is supposed to open in Washington, D.C. Right. on Pennsylvania Avenue. Now, it's been buried. There's been one columnist in the Washington Post who's got a, a good bite on this thing and has pushed it. The mayor, apparently, in the city and if all the people that had to be involved, when they cut the deal with Trump to build right. a hotel right. before all the lawsuits over the, host, uh, over the restaurant and all that, uh, basically didn't make a lot of this stuff public, and there was some freedom of information stuff that was done to get some of the details out. But what it appeared was um, the columnist for the Post indicated that uh, maybe because of things you re- you'd written and others had known, that he had to have some kind of a guarantee of about $45 million, and he had to get a loan from, uh, I think, Deutsche Bank right. to cover whatever outage it would be. So that in theory, if he walked away from that deal, like he did the other ones you've written about, right. The city wouldn't get hosed. They'd actually get something. Do you right. believe that's likely to I, be the case? I, well, I haven't <laughs> seen the contract in this case. I'm aware of what you're talking about. Let me point out that American banks won't loan money to Donald. Donald himself has said, I borrowed money knowing I didn't have to pay it back. And I've made a lot of money borrowing money I didn't pay back, which is true. And so Deutsche Bank, which has been at the heart of these big illegal tax shelters I was exposing years ago in the New York Times, right. um, uh, Deutsche Bank's one of the few banks that will loan him money, and generally on terms that secure them pretty well. Uh, but in this project, if we had a fine forensic audit of it internally, we'd find out Donald doesn't have any money in it. I'm sure of that. Mm-hmm. Because Donald doesn't put money into anything. All of his deals are, you give me money. Mm-hmm. So, all right? Well, a quick follow-up yeah. on that was apparently there was some kind of a guarantee. I'm not right. quite sure what right. the term was. That he had guaranteed the city at least $45 million dollars right out of his own money right. if he walked away. Now, do you yeah. think that's another joke? I, I don't think that <laughs> if you if we had the contract and the documents, I think we'd find out, even if it says Donald personally, there's something else in there we haven't seen because Donald just doesn't do those things. He used to, mm-hmm. when he went fell apart in 1990, yeah. he owed 900-plus million dollars on essentially a credit card because all these banks thought they were the only ones making unsecured loans to him with a personal guarantee. Mm-hmm. And you. they paid badly for mm-hmm. their Thank you. bad judgment. Are we going to get any women asking questions? <laughs> or just a whole group of people like me, old white guys? I'm having this good. change on Saturday. So. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Go ahead. We got a question on conflicts of interest. 
the polling data these days does suggest that Donald Trump is, is in a hole and is probably not going to win yeah, the election. Yeah, I don't trust the polls this year, to be mm. clear. I don't know, because I think there are an awful lot of white people in America who, underneath their skin, they don't want to sit next to a black person yeah. or a brown person or a yellow person on an airplane. Yeah. But go ahead. If he were to win the election, what sorts of conflicts of interest would oh. you see? And what do you, uh, from your knowledge about the Trump University case, what, uh, where do you see okay. that going? Let me deal with Trump University first. There's a whole long section about Trump University in my book. Um, as a matter of law, I don't see how Donald Trump gets out of the Trump University mess. It is a bait-and-switch fraud from beginning to end. And the Texas Attorney General's staff, who were denied bringing uh, litigation against Donald, civil litigation, they laid out the defenses he would make and showed why they wouldn't stand. Um, uh, so I, I don't know what he's going to do there. Um, and there are three lawsuits, two class action suits and the New York State Attorney General. You'll also read about a campaign finance contribution that the IRS should have shut down uh, the Donald J. Trump Foundation, but they've done nothing because guess what? We've stripped the IRS of assets to do its job and staff to do its job. Um, on, on the first part of the question about if Donald gets elected president, <clears throat> conflicts of interest are a minor problem. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let me give you the big problem. Let me give you the big problems we'll have right off. Okay, Donald called me April 27th at home to tell me that you know he'll sue me unless I write what he likes. I, I, you know, I've been doing this almost 50 years from the Santa Cruz, California City Council to the White House. He's the only politician who's ever told me that ever, and I've ended the careers of a fair number of both Democrats and Republicans. Um, if Donald is elected, first of all, I absolutely believe that some federal agency will start causing me trouble because Donald's going to use the government to go after the people he doesn't like because that's how he sees the world. And I talk at length about his personal philosophy he's written about at great length, which is revenge. It's the only person I know who says I'm a Christian whose whole philosophy is destroy <laughs> other people. Secondly, I would mostly be worried if I were a senior United <clears throat> States military officer, and I will... I'm, I think we can reasonably assume that the men and women who are in the Situation Room have all pulled out their law books to have a precise understanding of what happens and how you refuse an illegal order from the Commander-in-Chief. Because this is a man who's talked about, well, why don't we use nuclear weapons in, in Europe? Those are our allies. Um, we're going to torture people. We executed Japanese officers during, after World War II for waterboarding people. These people are not going to commit crimes that put them in jeopardy of their freedom and their lives, and that will be a crisis because Donald will order them to do these things. And if you see him fire one general or admiral, that's when you need to really get worried because of the implication of where that's going. Okay? Sir. Uh, this question is in the context only of him losing. The good news about Donald Trump having run. So what's the question? If he do you, loses, do you agree if with, he loses. with the statement? It, well, it, but if he loses, what? Well, the, the election. Okay. The, the the Republican Party that started being the racist institution that it was with a silent majority under yeah. Nixon is, I see it now is totally kaput. I'm not sure okay, what's so going to. So you really want to know what's going to happen to the Republican Party if he loses the election? Do you, do you agree the Republican Party I, is basically I, gone as it has been? I don't know if the Republican Party is gone. It may be, and I've said that. Okay, we certainly are going to see a massive realignment. But let's not just beat up on the Republicans. I'm a registered Republican. Um, after all, it was the Democrats in the South, you know, who ran Jim Crow. Right. Um, the Republicans have been trying now for 50 years to create this image that we are the conservative party. And as conservatives, we are principled people, and we believe in markets. My books are about, in large part, the undermining of market economics and rent-seeking and favors, um, that uh, we are not racists and that we are not xenophobes. And, you know, Donald Trump's completely undone 50 years of efforts to sell that message because it's not saleable right now. And I think you're going to see a huge crisis after the election if he loses and an effort to figure out what do we do and where do we go. But none of that will matter unless we stop what's happened in campaign finance. And Citizens United is the worst part of that. Chief Justice John Glover Roberts is wrong about this. The founders wrote at length about their concerns that inequality would destroy America. And I've written about this. You can look up my pieces in Newsweek and elsewhere about it. The founders were worried that 
money would lead to a society in which the business aristocrats would set up rules and persuade people who were workers only, that is they had no property, they didn't own tools, they didn't own land, and because they had no property, they would deceive those people into voting for policies that favor the business aristocrats and damage their own interests, kind of like what I think we've seen in, in the last 35 years. So I, I think there'll be a big crisis about it. Where it's going to go, I don't know. The Democrats need to have a realignment too, though. You know, they need to stop being Republican light. Yeah. So. Thank you. Sir. Um, excuse me. Why... Um, these facts you brought to light about the mob and things like that, why doesn't the media go into it? And why doesn't Hillary bring up how he calls her dishonest and he's so dishonest? Yeah. And also, I'm wondering if you could talk about his father's ties. I think it was with the Klan or? Yes. I'll, 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 but, well, first of all, I don't know why Hillary's doing her campaign the way she does. I'm not a politics person, okay? I mean, I'm, I know I'm sounding like I'm copping out, but I don't like covering politics. I like policy, all right? Uh, but secondly, if you're going to say that Donald Trump is involved with these mobsters and drug dealers and others, two things happen. Um, I've had a number of TV shows call me and they say, well, we need to have somebody from the other side. And I've said, okay, and they can't find anybody. And the Trump campaign, I say, well, call the Trump campaign, tell them I'm going to be on, ask them for a surrogate. Well, they don't want to participate. Well, I, you know, if you're not going to participate, that shouldn't allow you to kill the story, okay? And they all have libel concerns, even though this is in the public record. This is court documents, Donald's own testimony. And the reality is that the news business has shrunken down. The fastest disappearing white collar job in America, or virtually the fastest in the last 15 years, has been journalist. And newsrooms have been shedding people like crazy. I went back to the New York Times newsroom not so long ago, and I, it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I thought, preceding Donald Trump's famous remark, I could fire a shotgun off in this place and not hit anybody. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a lot of people there, but, but it's, it's shrunk. And with that shrinkage, there's a lot more concern about having money diverted from news to litigation and a view that the public doesn't want aggressive journalism. And if there's any message, by the way, the American people have given top journalists, the top editors and, and publishers, it's, we don't want you doing what I do. We don't want you doing this because it upsets us. It tells us things that we don't want to know. We want to believe what we believe. No. All right? About the Klan? Oh, the Klan. Thank you. I'm sorry. In 1927, about 1,000 guys in white robes and supporters, mostly people who were supporters, got into a pitched battle with New York City police in Jamaica, Queens. The newspapers at the time reported, and in those days when you were a cop, when you, you went to the cop shop, you know, they gave you the arrest reports and everything else, that among the people arrested was Fred Trump. It gave his address in Queens. Donald told the New York Times, and this is in the book earlier this year, well, no, that wasn't my father, you know, it was somebody else. He never lived at that address, and, and there were no charges, so you shouldn't write about it. If there were no charges, you shouldn't write about it. You know, if, if you're not supposed to write about it if there were no charges, but I don't think it was him. Well, it was him, it was his address, the public records show it's his address, and the idea we shouldn't write about something unless there's a criminal charge, I don't think I've seen him apply that to Hillary Clinton. <laughs> okay? So, next, sir. So what do oh, you we've think? at least moved out of the old white guy zone now. <laughs> All right. No gray hair. <laughs> I'm not really that way. But, um, no, I said we moved out of it. Yeah. Uh, so why do you think there is a sudden rise in Ahmadinejad-style politicians, not just you know, in democracies, non-democracies, everywhere? Right. All around know, the world, we're England, seeing the everywhere. rise of, yeah. yeah. Why, why is it that all around the world we're seeing uh, fundamentalist religious leaders, uh, Modi in India, um, who's a fundamentalist Hindu uh, in, in the Muslim world, although I would argue, because I actually read Debik, the magazine of uh, ISIL, that they're apostates. They're not Muslims. Um, but all around the world we're seeing this. We're seeing it among Christians. I think it's because the speed at which human knowledge is changing things, people can't, aren't equipped to cope with. I, I think that people are looking for some, you know, what's coming, and they're uncertain. And world economics are changing. And, and the rise of the Internet, which has eliminated enormous numbers of jobs in the world, and is going to eliminate a lot more jobs in the world by making things more efficient, but, you know, I have a little saying, inefficiency creates jobs. Um, it, it, it's leading people to be uh, fearful. 
and the nature of how we do television news. If it leads, it bleeds. Uh, people think there's a lot more crime out there than there is. Uh, you know, we have, we have very, very low crime now compared to the 1980s, compared to the 60s, compared to the 20s. Oh, yeah, crime is <laughs> as on, a, on a national level way, way, way down in this country. Your odds of being burglarized today are roughly one in four what they were in 1980, and most burglaries are done by adventuring teenagers, usually boys, but not always. They're not done by serious burglars. And so I think this, this rapid pace of change and the explosion of television-driven news has, it, uh, has really created a lot of fear and anxiety among people. And then we do have some societies, mostly our quote-unquote friends in Saudi Arabia, who are running schools where, you know, children are taught every day the same thing they're taught in North Korea, hate America. Yeah, today actually the New York Times had a very nice yes. article on it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. What do you think can be done, if anything, to get uh, Trump to release his tax returns that are at issue? Well, and what do you think are what's, yeah. well, what's I know in what, them I that mean, he's I, trying I, to if hide? If you read the book, you'll see basically what's in Trump's returns. I, I have shown that Donald almost certainly committed tax fraud in 1984. His own tax guy disavowed his tax return. Donald has participated in a sales tax fraud. Uh, um, there's a lot about Donald. This is the area that I'm best known for is taxes. We're never going to see Donald Trump's tax returns, okay? But what I've said is journalists should start saying to, to Trump, okay, you said you can't release the returns that are under audit. This is nonsense, by the way, but we'll take you at your word. We'd like to see your 1978 to 2008 tax returns because you have said the audits are closed on those returns. And he should be hounded about that. Where are your pre-2009 tax returns? And not as was suggested the other day by Larry Gibbs, who was the former IRS commissioner, uh, Form 1040 plus Schedule A, which has charitable deductions. His complete returns. Now, Mitt, Rom Mitt Romney wouldn't give us his returns because um, and I w I'm interested how many people raise your hand if you know this. Mitt Romney was not the manager of uh, Bain Capital Management. He was the sole owner. Anybody in the room know that? Okay, one person read my coverage back then. <laughs> he was the sole owner, and Congress has special rules. If you're the manager of a hedge fund or a private equity fund, you can live tax-free. You fold all your partnership profits back in. Then the carried interest they talk about, you pay that in distant future, which means the government just loaned you at zero interest all the taxes you should have paid. This is how people at the top are getting very rich. The government keeps saying, oh, you can pay your taxes, you know, somewhere in the distant years from now, decades from now, and it's a zero interest loan. Can you imagine how rich you would be if all the income taxes withheld from your check were in your investment account? And now you had to pay it back with no interest. And we're never gonna see Donald's returns. We need to pass a law. I actually wrote a column in the Daily Beast laying out how to do this. I wrote a column for Donald about how to come clean about his taxes that I actually believe if he had the courage to give it would get him elected president. It's called the, 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 the speech that could elect Donald Trump president. And then I wrote, I've written that Congress should pass a law that if you appear on the ballot of more than, pick a number, 10 states running for president, the IRS is required to disclose your tax return. And the only thing they're going to hold back is your social security number and um, uh, your at home address, if you used a home address. And tax returns were public in the 20s. You know, you could find out how much Julius Rosenwald, the founder of uh, Sears Roebuck, uh, I don't know if he was founder, but certainly the guy who built it up, paid in taxes. So, but we're never going to see his returns. But in my book, you will read a lot about his tax returns. So we got time for about, oh, we got six minutes left. This is a short one. I'm just curious to know why you're a registered Republican. <laughs> 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 they are the party of the big tent. I'm a Teddy Roosevelt guy. They should welcome me. And I've had many people call into radio show saying, you're a rhino. And I say, I'm sorry, either you're the party of the big tent or you're not. And where I live in western New York, the primaries are much more interesting. I mean, after all, I actually got to, well, I didn't get to vote because the polls that day opened after I had to leave town. But I was going to vote for a man running for president a few years ago who believes dinosaurs and human beings coexisted. And, you know, you, you know, Democrats don't give you opportunities like that. <laughs> Ma'am. 
Um, as someone like you who wrote about Trump's tax returns and what could be in them back in March, um, I've been disappointed every time I write about these issues that the people that really need to learn more and understand them They're refuse to listen. Where did you write about it? Uh, I write for Market Watch. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, I, I don't. I, but but yeah. let me ask the question. Yeah. So the question is, um, I don't want to preach to the choir. Um, The reason why I took a job as a journalist at 54 years old is because I want to convert those who don't believe in what they should and don't understand yet what they should. What's the question? So the question is, is how do we do that? Okay. How do you and I do that? Is it writing a book? Is it okay. writing more? Is it is it going out there and telling I, them? I'm not in the business of trying to convert people to what I think is the right way to think. Okay. In my class at Syracuse University, when they asked me to teach, um, they thought I would teach modern tax policy. I said, at the end of the day, that just becomes, no matter how hard I try, what I think about tax policy, which teaches nobody anything. I want to give people useful information in a way they can understand it so they will come to decisions. Now, the point that you're raising, that we have a lot of people in this country, and they're not just on the right, who will not pay attention to facts. There's actually been a lot of psychological research done about it. If you want to read a good, quick little book, Farhad Manju, F-A-R-H-A-D-M-A-N-J-O, wrote a book called True Enough. And when you look at the cover, you'll think it's a Boy Scout. It's not, but it's true enough to being a Boy Scout. And what the research shows is that if you tell people something they believe is not true, Saddam Hussein, you know, a, a Ba'athist thug, had nothing to do with a religious zealot by the name of Osama bin Laden. You show them videotape of President George Bush saying, of course Os- Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with 9-11. Their response will be, oh, well, they were just trying to appease the liberal media. And you can find the same things with people on the left. You can show it about uh, football games. He talks about what he calls a famous football game. I think it was between Princeton and Harvard. I don't know how famous that would be. But there's lots of research of this where people double down on what they wish to be true. And I think that's a failure of our education system. We have an education system that was designed to prepare people for rote jobs drone jobs, not for critical thinking skills. You can have a better conversation with the average waiter in rural Slovakia or Canada than you can with the average MBA sitting in first class on a jetliner. And it's, I think that's a failing of our education system, and we need to really work at that. We need to make people more politically sophisticated. We need to make them critical thinkers. Um, one of the things I've been fascinated by is that my children grew up with very good schools and they know you don't trust anything on the internet. But I've had students and I've gone and lectured at high schools where students say what Donald Trump said. Well, it was on the internet and they assume it's true. And I think this is a, this problem is not going to get solved in my lifetime and it's not going to get solved probably in yours. Well, I'm going to go teach. So go try. I'm taking your advice. Please try. (laughs) Hi there. Hi. You've told us uh, many bad things about Donald Trump, but are there any positive things about Donald Trump in your book? I mean, I can tell you a couple of positive things about Donald Trump. I mean, he built Trump Tower, which is quite an accomplishment. Um, He uh, successfully shut down numerous law enforcement and journalism investigations about himself. That's an accomplishment. I mean, it may not be what most people think of, but it is. Positive accomplishment. Well, I think from his perspective, that's a very positive accomplishment. no. But, but, I mean, the fundamental fact is no. I've tried very hard. Um, uh, and when you read the book, I think you'll see why. Donald is a world-class narcissist. Mm-hmm. Donald is only about Donald. You don't exist except to either glory Donald or be a foil. And he, just, he, he has no empathy for other people. And so everything he does is about money. Cutting off the health care for this child, it's about money. And so, you know, I, I, when I was working on the book and I was sleeping and wording and sleeping and writing, you know, I, I called up some other people and I said, i got to have some perspective here. You know, let's go through some things Donald has done. And nobody could come up with anything. His businesses fail because he doesn't know how to run a business. He's not a good negotiator. There are people who teach negotiation who've written about this, and the terms of his deals tell you that. And, no, I can't point to anything beyond the signature accomplishment of building Trump Tower. And there he benefited from his father being having as his best friend the mayor of New York who 
or issued orders. Whatever Mr. Trump wants, he's going to get. And the bureaucracy turned to his side. Even the Woolman rink, Donald told people it was a pro bono project and he got him to work for free. No, he got $10 million for it. So it, means it, it is literally all a fraud, his life. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, if, if I had one, I would tell you, all right? Okay. Well, listen, thank you all very much.